Howdy! You're listening to The Breakaway Podcast, a Bible study recorded on the campus of Texas A&M. Thanks for listening and enjoy the talk. Let me begin with a principle, and it's this, that commitment is costly. Commitment is costly, and the higher the cost, the harder we contemplate whether or not it's worth it. Uh, You see this at the grocery store. Uh, If you go shopping on the day they're giving out free samples, many of you, that's the only day you go shopping because, hey, free meal, right? Sundays, you show up at HEB and that adorable little lady is sitting out there, her little table. Would you like to try some sausage? Yes, I would, right? Low commitment? Sure, I'll take a moment and hang out with you, sweet lady, and eat some of this sausage on this tray, right? But then when she hands you a coupon and says, but would you like to buy a package of this sausage? Then you have to go, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Uh, I don't know how into this I am. Like at free? Good. Great. You get a moment of my time, but you're asking for my money? Where's this relationship going? How into this am I? And uh, I don't know if I want to commit money to this product, right? You see it in dating. Ladies, for some of you, you might be dating a guy, and uh, you've been together with a while. Things are going great. Fine. Fine. But you go out with your girlfriends sometime, you're hanging out one night, you're all having fun, and maybe some really cute guy that is really amazing, got a lot going for him, shows an interest in you, and you got to shut him down. And as he continues to make advances, you go, I'm sorry, I'm with someone else, you just move along. And maybe you do that, and maybe you stand strong and tell that guy, you go off, but at the end of it, you go, whew, that was hard, right? That was hard to turn down. And you may have done it, but I promise at that moment, you're going to sit there and go, so where's this relationship going? Because I just took a hit for this guy. How serious am I about this relationship? Because that just cost me an opportunity, right? Or maybe some of you guys, you're dating a girl and she's nice, sweet, it's fun, all right? But as the months stack up, you're starting to notice more and more of your time is spent with her, less and less with your buddies. You don't get to go hang out and play football whenever you want to, go watch a game whenever you want to. No, you're not going to go see the opening of Thor with your buddies because she wants to see a different movie with a lot more kissing and emotional drama. And you're having to do these sorts of things and you're realizing this takes time. It's taking my energy. I'm having to talk about my feelings, which I never do. And now as Christmas approaches, you realize it's about to cost you money and you're going to have to be creative, like a gift card's not going to cut it. And as you sit there and go, oh my gosh, I have to like think about a present in a romantic way to express it. And as you just think about the cost, some of you go, so where's this relationship going? You know what I mean? Like, is this the one? Because the higher the cost, the harder you start thinking about the commitment. How deep into this am I, right? Relationships are free, but intimacy is costly. And you start to analyze, is it worth it? I'll tell you, as a person who talks at camps, I I see this all the time with high school kids, uh, as I speak at camps and talk about Jesus. You'll see a lot of kids towards the end of a camp get excited about Jesus, and they get fired up about him. And for some of them, it's fired up about the person of Jesus. Like, I'm presenting him, and they're realizing he's amazing. I want to know him. I want to be a part of what he's doing, and that's awesome. Some of them, it's not so much about Jesus. It's just they kind of like Jesus' people. They sort of like his house. The music there is cool. The food's pretty good. They just kind of like hanging with his people. And yet, for many of them, they'll be in a camp setting going, I want to belong to Jesus. I want to be his. And yet, as they contemplate going home, and some of you maybe experienced this in high school, that as you contemplate going home, maybe you go, okay, if I, if I really do commit to him, man, that means when I go back, I'm going to join a Bible study, and I'm going to get involved in church. And you know what? I'm going to face a little bit of, of ridicule. Some of my buddies back home I've been hanging with are going to go, so are you becoming one of those holy people now? You're going to a Bible study? Like, really? Like, who do you think you are? And you're going to get some pushback on that. Or if I start making some decisions based on that, like I'm not going to go be at that thing that night. I'm not going to partake of this. I'm not going to joke like that because of my allegiance to Jesus. And when it starts to change your life, it becomes not just a little bit of ribbing and tickling. For some of you, it might become rejection. That some people say, I don't want to hang with you. You've changed and I don't like the new you. And I've seen students, when they contemplate that, a commitment to Jesus might cost me something. 
you see them start to contemplate, how into this am I? Is this really worth it? Some of you are there right now. That's your college experience. That some of you, you've come to know Jesus maybe for years, maybe just here in college, and you're his, and a relationship with him is free. It is a free relationship, but that intimacy of knowing him becomes costly. And for some of you, as you're into this relationship with him, things start to happen where you get advances from someone who's interested in you, and you know you can go places sexually that would be exciting and fun, and you shut it down for no other reason than your allegiance to Jesus. And I've seen people and watched people and been in that place when I was younger of going, okay, I shut down some opportunities for you, Jesus. Man, this better be worth it. Because that was hard. Or some of you, you decide, I'm going to go for it and really be his, and you got your Bible on your desk in your dorm room, and you wear the Christian t-shirt, and you say, I'm associated with him, and you're excited about it, and what you run into in your dorm is rejection. And some people make fun of you, and you've been taking hits all semester because of your allegiance to Jesus. And you're sitting here tonight going, you know, how into this am I? Because this is costing me. Or maybe some of you, you're not committed to Jesus, but you're thinking about it. You're at a place like this, thinking about it, and you're evaluating the cost, and you're going, okay, if it's going to cost me to be associated with him, how deep into this am I? Because commitment is costly. It is. And you say, well, Ben, why are you bringing this up? Because this is where we are in the Gospels right now. If We've been intersecting with this story. If you read it, we're coming in where the disciples had been walking with Jesus, and for the first couple of years, it was pretty fun. They're rolling with Jesus, and there's a little bit of rejection. Some religious leaders don't like them. But the truth is, for the first year or so, they're just moving from miracle to miracle, from mind-blowing sermon to mind-blowing sermon. And the crowds are getting bigger. People are starting to get onto the Jesus thing. And being part of his inner circle is kind of awesome. They're like, yeah, I know him. We hang with, hey, he knows my name. Oh, Jesus, sorry, I got to go. Jesus is calling me, all right? And it feels kind of awesome to be his. And they're rolling with him, and they're having a good time. And he takes them away on a private retreat here in Luke chapter 9. And he gets into a serious place with them relationally and says, okay, you guys have hung with me. You guys know me. Who do you think I am exactly? And they lay out to them for the first time directly, I think you're the Christ of God. I think you're God's official representative on this planet. That's who I think you are. And Jesus said, that's right. Now let me unpack for you what the Christ is about, what I'm here to do. He said, I'm here to accomplish God's mission, and guess what? We're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to face rejection there. I'm going to suffer there, and they're going to kill me. And let me tell you something. If you're associated with me, then when you walk with me, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be rejection. There's going to be death. So let's ride. Who's in? And you see him present that to them, and their response is, oh, man. Some of the other gospels show us that Peter reacts strongly like, no, Jesus, I don't want a story of the Christ that's like that. I want it to be fun and happy and great and life enhancing. I don't want suffering. I don't want rejection. What are you talking about? Stop doing this. And they get to a place where they realize if I'm going to stay committed to him, it's costly. And is this a road I want to be on? And some of you, I just feel like this is where you've been this semester at this moment. And so I wanted to bring us here because as they're looking at this moment, you go, man, what is it they're going to need in a moment like that? What do you need from God when you realize that walking with him is hard? And some of you, your commitment to him has created internal struggles that you fight against immorality sexually. You fight against some things that all your buddies are enjoying and you don't. Some of you externally, it's cost you relationally, and you've just been taking the hits, and you're wondering, God, is it worth it? And what does God has for us tonight? Is it worth it? And what you see in this moment is Jesus takes these guys, and he takes them up a mountain. And he walks them up there, and it says they get up to the top, and it says, now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. Jesus gets them to a place where he says, this is hard and so they're discouraged, and then he walks them up a mountain, so they're exhausted. And so when we meet meet our disciples here tonight, they're discouraged and exhausted, which I think is where maybe a lot of you are at this point in the semester. And Jesus gets them there, and they fall asleep. And it says as they do that, Jesus prays, they sleep, and it says as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. Jesus begins to shine with glory. 
just to give a little glimpse of what he's like. Now, the interesting thing about that is Jesus begins to shine, but they don't see it. They're still asleep. And yet in verse 32, a couple verses later, it says, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. And if you're sitting here tonight and you're struggling with, oh God, is it worth it? The cost of discipleship, is it worth it? Can I tell you something? What Jesus gives his disciples is not a three-point ha- plan to have happy little religious moments. He gives them what they need the most. If you're contemplating if this relationship's worth it, let me just show you me. And he begins to shine. And the crazy thing is he's shining whether we see it or not. And yet in verse 32, they become fully awake and get to see his glory. So my hope tonight as we look at this last sermon of mine for this semester to you, as I thought about this moment, I'm just praying, oh God, you are shining, oh Jesus, you really are glorious, and we're wondering, are you worth it sometimes, but you really are, and so my prayer for us on the lawn tonight is that God might open our eyes that we'd be fully awake to see his glory, because the commitment is costly. How can I keep pressing on when it's hard? I look at the one I'm in relationship with and see, is he worth it? And so there's a lot we can touch down on. I just want to show you three things about this man we're associated with if we are Christians. And the first thing you see is that Jesus Christ is the hero of history. He's the hero of history. Jesus begins to glow, dazzling white. And in verse 30, it says, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. Now that is incredible. And I don't know if that really lands on us, how amazing that is. We can kind of read that, and Jesus began to glow, and Moses and Eliza showed up, bop, 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 and we're reading that. I just don't think many of us realize how mind-blowing that would be to a Jewish, Jewish audience that Moses and Elijah, who've been long dead, just showed up at the left and right hand of Jesus, all right? Moses and Elijah, you don't get two bigger celebrities in Jewish culture than Moses and Elijah, all right? And they show up to celebrate Jesus. This would be mind-blowing to a Jew. Okay, I'm contemplating whether or not to walk with Jesus. And Moses and Elijah, the two great heroes of our faith, just showed up to give him an amen. That is mind-blowing. How do I even get my head around that? What do I compare that to? As I thought about it, I remembered from my childhood Christmas. You know, we're coming up on Christmas. It's on its way here. I remember for me as a young child, maybe many of you were the same, Santa was amazing, right? I mean, I don't know if you remember back in the day when people are unpacking to you and you're trying to get your head around, you're like, okay, this guy takes requests, manufactures toys, flies through the air and delivers them across the globe in a single night. He's going to drop into this house, know what I want, put that out there and leave Mind blown. Unreal. Santa Claus was incredible. And yet for me, like many children, I'm a little torn because I go, okay, what's Christmas about? And everyone's unpacking Santa Claus, how amazing he is. And they're saying, oh, but it's also about Jesus and his birthday and the fact that he was born and no one would let him stay at his house. And so he had to like knock on a bunch of doors until he was born in a barn. And you're like, okay, so what's Christmas about? It's about Jesus being born in a barn this guy delivering presents. And as a kid, I'm like, how do those connect at all? And I'm trying to put them together, and you're trying to feel as excited about Jesus as about this guy, but you're like, but Jesus is arising on the scene, but this guy's giving me toys? And you're like, but I feel like I should be pumped about this. Like, how do I reconcile whose holiday is this? Who really owns Christmas, right? And I never forget for me the day I walked into my grandma's house, and I'm a little kid, and I walk in, and my eyes are about coffee table height, you know? And I remember walking in, and there was a little statue on the coffee table. And I'll never forget, it was an image, and it was Santa Claus on his knees with his hat off, exposing his bald little head. And he's clutching it to his chest with his head bowed, and he's, he's worshiping at the feet of little baby Jesus in the manger. And I remember for me, you know, I, I didn't know the whole story of 
St. Nicholas at that moment and how amazing his conversion was and that he was someone who'd been transformed by Jesus and that made him generous. I didn't know all that history. That came later. But for me as a little kid, just seeing that, I'm like, this amazing person, Santa, bows at the feet of this more amazing person, Jesus. That's how they relate, that he falls at the feet of Jesus. That was huge to me. And that's what's happening here. That their luminaries, Moses, parted the Red Sea. Moses, who went up on the mountain and talked to God face to face. Moses, who got us out of slavery and into the promised land. Moses is hanging with Jesus. Elijah, the great miracle worker of the Old Testament, is here at the left hand of Jesus. They're celebrating Jesus. They're with him. They're amening him. It would be like if you're running for yell leader and E. King Gill came back and said, you guys think I have Aggie spirit. This guy's next level. And you'd be like, wait, what? Who wouldn't vote for that guy? And they come in and you see that they're not just here amening Jesus, that Jesus is their hero. I mean, Moses at the end of his life in the book of Exodus doesn't get to go into the promised land. God says, it's not for you to go in at this moment. You're not going to lead my people into this land of promise. Now here, generations later in Luke chapter 9, his feet stand in the promised land because he stands with Jesus. Jesus hooks him up. And in this moment, these disciples who are wondering, is Jesus worth following? Is he really worth what it's going to cost me socially, relationally? Is he worth it? They look up and they see their heroes in history and say these historical figures, Jesus is their hero. He's worth me following too. And can I just tell you something? I just spent a day or two just looking back through history and reading about all the luminaries that have bowed at the feet of this king. I mean, Charles Dickens wrote a Christmas carol, wrote a letter to his kids, wrote him a whole work called The Life of Our Lord, and he opened it, my dear children, I'm very anxious that you should know something about the history of Jesus Christ, for everybody ought to know about him. No one ever lived who was so good, so kind, so gentle, and so sorry for all people who did wrong or were in any way ill or miserable. Goethe, perhaps the most famous German author, wrote Faust, said, I esteem the Gospels to be thoroughly genuine, for there shines from them the reflected splendor of a sublimity proceeding from the person of Jesus, so divine as kind as only the divine could ever have manifested on earth. Shakespeare, at the end of his life, said, I commend my soul into the hands of God, my creator, hoping and assuredly believing through only the merits of Jesus Christ, my Savior, to be made a partaker of life everlasting. Webster! The dictionary Webster! <laughs> wrote, in my view, the Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. William Colgate. And you're like, where do I know that name? Because you brush your teeth with Colgate! He says the only spiritual light in the world comes through Jesus Christ and the inspired book, Redemption and Forgiveness of Sin Alone, through Christ, without his presence and the teachings of the Bible, we'd be enshrouded in moral darkness and despair. Mary Todd Lincoln was asked after Abe Lincoln died, and we celebrate 150 years after his Gettysburg Address today, Mary was asked the moment before he was shot, what was he talking about? What was on his mind? And she said this. She said he, wanted, he said he wanted to visit the Holy Land and see those places hallowed by the footprints of the Savior. He was saying that there was no city he so much desired to see as Jerusalem. And with those words half spoken on his tongue, the bullet entered his head and the soul of the great president was carried by the angels to the New Jerusalem. Theodore Roosevelt said, my great joy and glory in occupying an exalted position in this nation is that and I am enabled to preach the practical moralities of the Bible to my fellow countrymen and to hold up Christ as the hope and savior of the world. Harvard University in their charter said, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed 
to consider well that the main end of his life and his studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all solid knowledge and learning. And we could go on and on. I've got pages of quotes like this from artists to historians, from presidents, politicians, the famous and the infamous throughout history saying there was no one like this person, Jesus. No one changed this place like him. And so let me tell you something. For me in college, I remember being in moments where I just felt like I was taking hits for him. I felt isolated. I felt alone. My freshman year, I remember I was so hard to find Christian community. It's hard to get yourself out there. And man, I just felt like there were so many people getting to indulge in things that my commitment to Jesus was keeping me from. And I'm like, Jesus, I'm getting a whole lot of nothing here. What have you got for me? And let me tell you something. As I begin to read C.S. Lewis and Brother Lawrence and Oswald Chambers and men throughout history that held on to him when it was hard and he showed up in their lives and it was worth it, the more I saw that Jesus was the hero of these great men in history, the easier it was for me to follow him even when it was hard. Are you finding it difficult to trust him? He's the hero of history. Put your faith in him. You're not just a part of a little story playing out in your dorm room. You're part of a bigger story that runs through history. And yet he's not just the hero of history. He's the son of the Almighty. And it's fascinating in this moment, it, Jesus begins to shine. His face shines. A cloud enshrouds them. God speaks over him. You get this moment coming around that sounds exactly like when God met with Moses in Exodus. And you really see this is a repetition of Sinai, basically. Jesus is like Moses. And in this moment, Peter does what a lot of people in that moment may have done. You see, Moses, Jesus, Elijah, all this glory. And he goes, this is incredible. Jesus is on par with Moses and Elijah. And so Peter says, let's build some huts. I'll build three of them. Each of you will get one. We'll hang out here. And you guys are incredible. And we'll just celebrate you guys. And Moses, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter, third time's a charm, does what a lot of people do with Jesus. Amazing guy, right up in par with some of the greatest religious leaders that have ever lived. He's incredible. And so Peter says, you are on the same level as like a Moses or Elijah. Unbelievable. And as Peter presents this idea, Luke says, and Peter didn't know what he was talking about. And that was sweet of Luke trying to defend him. Luke's like he was tired and he just didn't know what he was saying, right? And why does Luke say that? Because Peter was missing something that God decides to straighten him out on. And a cloud begins to descend on the mountain, which is always a symbol of God's glory. And God himself speaks from the mountain and he says, Peter, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And the others dissipated. And it says, and Jesus stood there alone. And God Almighty quotes Deuteronomy 18. He quotes Moses where Moses, as he was leaving and had done all the preaching he could do to his people, he said, there will come a prophet like me in the future. Listen to him. Follow him. Moses, with his last breath, says, there's another one coming. Leap in behind him. And God looks down at Jesus and says, that's him. And he's not just a great religious figure. He's my son. He's my son. Jesus is not just a fantastic moral preacher. He is the Son of the Almighty, shining with the very glory of God. Right? I love the way Hebrews chapter 3 says it. It says, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by somebody, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, God is building a house, 
And that house is called us, the people of God. And he said, Moses was great. Moses was faithful. But Moses was like a really rocking servant. He was like a killer lawn guy at the house of God. Great job. Jesus is like the son, the son of the house, the one who owns the house. I mean, it would be amazing if you met the president's assistant. I mean, he's probably a great guy. I don't know who he is. He could be awesome. But there's something totally different meeting the assistant of the president and meeting the guy who actually has the power over the free world, right? That's a different power altogether. And God says, Moses is amazing. There's a lot of spiritual leaders that are incredible, but they're like servants in the house. But there's one son who owns the house. He's like no other. His name is Jesus. So let me tell you something. When you have difficulty following Jesus, some of us go, man, it's, it's your religious commitment. You're being a good church-going person. No, it's a commitment to the Son of God the Son of the Almighty. I remember one time when I was having a particularly difficult time trusting Jesus with my life. I felt like I was taking hits from my allegiance to him. I told it to a minister. I was kind of complaining about how much I was suffering for God. And I just remember he said to me, well, Ben, what are you going to do? Not trust God? And that was like the end of the story. It was very non-tender pastoral care. And that's really the end of the conversation. I was like, well, thanks for a whole lot of nothing. I appreciate that. That was awesome. And I left, and, and I just contemplated what he was saying. He was like, well, Ben, basically, you can trust God or not. What do you want to do? And I thought about that. I could be a guy that says, I don't want to trust God. I'm going to do whatever I want. But what kind of life is that? If I want to know God, is there going to be suffering? Yes. But he said, you want to follow me? You connect to my son. That's my chosen one. Listen to him. So if I want to know God, the only way to him is through that son. And so if following him is hard, that's the only path that's worthwhile. Jesus in John chapter 6 gave a tough message to people. Jesus got a big crowd when he was handing out free bread. But then he started talking about blood and sacrifice and hardship. And I'll never forget in college, I looked up John 666 because I thought, ooh, ooh, and John 666 said, and many left him and followed him no longer. And I was like, ooh, right? And what happened? They said, we like the Jesus handing out bread, but if it gets hard, we don't want to follow him. And a lot of people left him when it got hard. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, what about you? You want to go, you want to stay? And they said, where would we go? You have the words of life. And I remember for me in college, weeping at one time, saying, it's so hard to follow you, Jesus, sometimes. It's hard. But I remember thinking, but where would I go? You have the words of life. We count our days by your birthday. You are the centerpiece of history. You have the very words of life. You're the son of God. No man changed history like you. If I left you, where would I go? There's nowhere else to go where life can be found. So if you're struggling, he's the hero of history. You walk on a well-worn road, and he's the son of the Almighty. You're following the son of God, not just some religious teachings. He's the best person to link your life up to, because the last thing is, he's our deliverer from slavery. He's our deliverer from slavery. Luke is the only one who tells us all the... Synoptic Gospels tell us about this moment, but only Jesus tells us, or excuse me, Luke tells us what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about. In verse 31, it says, they appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And I love that because the word departure in Greek is the word exodus. Exodus. And what Luke is showing us in this moment is Jesus is so much like Moses, takes him up onto the mountain, 
Face shines in the presence of God. The cloud comes rolling in. Deuteronomy 18 quoted, Jesus is like Moses. And then it says when they came to talk to him, they didn't talk about how great heaven is, how neat Jesus is. They talked about Jesus' exodus. Jesus is like Moses, but he's greater than Moses. He's the true Moses. He's the Moses Moses was looking for. He's the one who leads the big exodus. The one, the exodus we've been studying all semester, mirrors and pictures and foreshadows. Jesus was going on an exodus. You go, what does that mean? It says he was about to accomplish it in Jerusalem. That Jesus was about to step out of this world and go through the very valley of the shadow of death. He was to face rejection and death for our sin. That he was going to journey into the grave for three days and then rise again and come forth. That whoever wants freedom from sin will follow him. Why do you follow Jesus when it's hard? Because he's the hero of history. Presidents from George Washington through today have cried out to him in times of need. You follow a well-worn road. He's the son of the Almighty. He's the very son of God. No one in history was like this man. And he's the real deliverer. That I don't know what sin you struggle with, I don't know what difficulties that you're faced with, but all of us have addictions and brokenness and sadness in us that you can't fix and no self-help book can. But Jesus is the true and better Moses who leads us on the real exodus. That he's not just God Almighty, he's God Almighty who has come close to us to take us from where we are to where we need to be. That's what's so amazing about this moment is they see the glory of Jesus. He's the son of God, but he's the son of God who's come for us and come to journey into our pain with us, to associate with us that deeply. As I was preparing for this moment, I, I just thought about, well, the moment I graduated seminary, it took me nine years to get out of seminary. I don't know how long it's taken you to get out of college. If it's under nine years, be encouraged. Um, <laughs> But I remember as I went through that, it was so hard. Nine years of school is hard. And um, I got to that moment, and I remember my wife gave me a book the day I graduated from seminary. And, and I, I remember opening it, and I was like, you know, I didn't want to make a big deal out of seminary, whatever. I didn't even want to go to graduation, but I went. And she gave me this book, and as I opened it, it was letters that she had had people write. And a whole section of them were people that were just heroes of the faith to me. The founder of Breakaway. First guy who ever hired me and mentored me in ministry. Louis Giglio. All kinds of different people that were luminaries, heroes in the faith to me. And it was amazing to see in this moment of my journey, of my story. It's me going to seminary. It's not their story. It's not what they're doing. But, but they cared enough about me that they wrote this letter to me. And as I was reading over this book and them saying they're with me and they're celebrating with me and they're walking with me, I just felt this feeling of these great luminaries of the faith are drawing near to me in my story. And I just felt this incredible encouragement from that. That's incredible to me. And I don't know if you feel that, that as they're looking here, they see Jesus and his glory, how amazing he is. And he says, but I'm here to go on a journey, on an exodus. And when the glory leaves and shuts down, Jesus didn't leave, he remained to step off that mountain with Peter and John and James and enter into their story and to say, I'm gonna be with you in the struggle. And I don't know what struggles you're in, but Jesus is God Almighty who's come to be our deliverer, to step into your slavery to sin and say, I'm gonna associate with you here. I'm gonna walk into your Egypt of addiction and your Egypt of fear, and your Egypt of, of depression and sadness and hurt, I'm going to be here with you. And I'm not just going to sit here and weep with you, but I'm going to weep with you, and then I'm going to walk with you through the Red Sea of certain death, through the wilderness of struggle and refinement, all the way to the land of promise. I'm going to walk with you. Jesus is worth following, young people. Why? Because he's the hero of history. He's God Almighty. And he is our deliverer, that whatever you're in, he wants to sit near you in your dorm room, in your place of deepest struggle. And he alone can deliver you from slavery to sin 
and into life. Trust him. And I promise you, when, these, when your days of this life are over, you're going to be thrilled that you walked with the one who loved you like this. It's funny, George Patton, the general during World War II, was a pretty harsh man. But as he was commanding the Third Army, he gave them a great speech calling them into war. And it's scary entering into war. It's scary marching out to battle. But on the eve of World War II, as he spoke to his troops, he gave a profanity-laced sermon that I won't repeat. But I remember at the end of it, he was telling these men that they're going to enter into hardship, but it's for a great cause, for the cause of freedom. And as he ended his speech, he ended it in the funniest way. He said, and when you're an old man and your grandchild comes and sits upon your knee, he said, and they speak to you and say, Grandpa, where were you during the great World War II? He said, you will not have to say, well, I was shoveling dung in Louisiana. And that's how he ended the speech. And you go, what a weird thing to say. And what he meant was this, and it was so beautiful. He was telling them, you're entering into a story. You're associating with a cause that's going to have extreme sacrifice. But I promise you, when you get to the end, you're going to get to that moment and you are going to be so glad at the glorious end that you stayed in it, even when it's hard. And you're going to be thrilled when we cross into that threshold of liberty to say, I didn't live some periphery story. I stayed in the big story, even when it was hard. And praise God that I wasn't doing something goofy somewhere else when this amazing story was playing out in history. And I have to believe that he was just paraphrasing the great speech of Henry V from Shakespeare. As Henry t or Shakespeare tells the story of Henry V leading these English troops to fight to liberate the people of England, that as they became weary and discouraged and broken and just trying to get home, and as they tried to get home, there was so much opposition. And at one moment with their numbers dwindled, they realized no one's coming to rescue us. It's just us, and we're going to have to go through a horrible battle to get home. They were wondering, can we even make it? And Shakespeare says of this day that Henry, the king, steps before his people, and as they are on the eve of battle, he says, this is glorious. And they look at their injuries and their losses and the pain in front of them and they say, how is this glorious? And he says, I promise you that all the pain will be badges of honor. That this story good men will teach his son. That as crisp and crispy and day, the day of their battle, shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that they fought with us upon St. Crispin's day. He says, I promised you a day's coming that if you link up with this battle, when all the wars are fought, your injuries will be badges of honor. And all those who opted out will find their manhood cheap when people tell the story of the battles we fought for our great king. And you may suffer in the name of Jesus. It may cost you socially. It may cost you relationally. It may give you rejection and suffering. But I promise you, he is the son of God, our deliverer, our hero, our king. And when he leads us into the promised land, you're going to be grateful that you hung in there when it was hard. And every wound, every loss, every scar will be a glorious reminder that I stood with the king. And thank God that I was with him through the wilderness to the promised land.